Welcome to this audio descriptive introduction to Hall's Croft, the home of William Shakespeare's elder daughter Susanna and her husband John Hall. It is one of a number of Shakespeare heritage sites you can visit in Stratford-upon-Avon, cared for by the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. Introductions to Shakespeare's Birthplace and Shakespeare's New Place are also available online. The Trust holds the world's largest public collection related to Shakespeare, comprising books, archival documents and museum artefacts. These can be accessed through an online catalogue or by visiting the Reading Room, and collection highlights are on display within the historic houses. Hall's Croft lies on Old Town a 10 to 15 minute walk from Shakespeare's birthplace on Henley Street and under 10 minutes walk from New Place on Chapel Street. At the southeast end of Henley Street there's a roundabout. The third exit on the right leads onto High Street. New Place is on the left of Chapel Street. Chapel Street becomes Church Street, at the end of which is a street on the left called Old Town. Hall's Croft is on Old Town, on the left. There are parking spaces on Church Street and Blue Badge on-street parking on Chapel Lane, just off Chapel Street. Hall's Croft is a three-storey Jacobean building. Its facade is light brown plaster and timber, with three gabled roofs, brick chimneys and rectangular windows with small, leaded rectangular panes. A small flower bed lies in front with a magnolia tree almost as tall as the third storey. Wisteria covers the right side of the house and is in bloom in late spring. There is a central studded wooden door with a coat of arms above, combining the Shakespeare and Hall family crests. The right half is yellow and black and slashed by a ceremonial spear, Shakespeare's coat of arms. The left half contains three dogs' heads in profile. The visitor's entrance is to the right of the house. There is a step up and a bell to call for ramped access. One small vestibule leads through to another, with the café ahead and shop and ticket desk in a room to the left. The shop walls are panelled in deep brown wood. Assistance dogs are welcome on all sites. Concessionary tickets are available, which include entrance to additional Shakespeare Birthplace Trust sites. For further information, visit the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust website at shakespeare.org.uk. Here you can also listen to audio descriptions of highlight objects from the collections. Some of these objects will be on display on site. Most of the ground floor and garden of Hall's Croft are wheelchair accessible, but the first floor is not. A tablet with images of the first floor is available on request. In comparison to the house where William Shakespeare was born, Hall's Croft is a more opulent and spacious abode, containing fine examples of Jacobean furniture. Inside the walls and ceiling are white plaster, scored with thick, dark brown beams. Floors are original flagstones in some rooms, and wooden floorboards in others, and are slightly uneven. The current interiors offer a taste of affluent domestic life in the Hall's era, some information about the medical practices that John would have undertaken, and paintings representative of the period. The physician John Hall was born in 1575 and settled in Stratford around 1600 when he set up his medical practice. Susanna and John married in 1607 and had a daughter Elizabeth in 1608. John was a Puritan, while Susanna may have had Catholic sympathies as she was once arrested for refusing communion on Easter Sunday. The couple were wealthy enough to have this house built for them between 1613 and 1614, though after William's death in 1616 he left them new place in his will. The original house has been extended considerably. 
The initial building did not include the right section of the current façade. It was extended several times in the 17th century, and again in 1865. After the halls, the house was owned by a family of lawyers, the Smiths, then later used as a school, and occupied by actors amongst many other owners. The shop leads into a hallway, with a wide staircase to the right, and a rectangular room to the left, with a large brick hearth flanked by two iron swans. The hall is decorated with a tall carved cupboard with ceramic items on top and leads through to a parlour. There are chairs for visitors by the open parlour doorway. The parlour was used to entertain guests. It's furnished with gleaming carved wooden cupboards and chests, an ornate wooden high chair, an elaborate armchair, and a central table laid with pewter plates and mugs. The back and legs of the high chair is made up of many ridged cylinders, with smooth round nubs of wood extending from them, creating an intricate bead-like effect. On the wall in the parlour there's an example of a pious family portrait of the era, a family saying grace before a meal attributed to Antonius Clicence. A full description is available to listen to in the online object recordings. Two small rooms beyond the parlour, a passageway and a room dressed as an apothecary's dispensary, are accessed by four steps up. Please note there is no handrail. On the walls of the passageway are framed copies of Susanna and John Hall's epitaphs and some of John's correspondence with patients. Susanna's epitaph begins, Witty above her sex, but that's not all. Wise to salvation was good mistress Hall. Something in Shakespeare was in that but this, holy of him with whom she's now in bliss. The passageway leads to the recreated apothecary's dispensary, where medicines would be made and sold. It is a small space on the right, which is roped off. The room is furnished with a wooden table, two cupboards and shelves at the rear. These hold colourful ceramic jars in which raw ingredients and medicines were kept, such as syrup of orange peel, which was thought to be a blood cleanser. Some jars have the contents written on the exterior. A small pair of scales hangs from a shelf. Medicines and treatments used by John Hall and his contemporaries were designed to bring the four humours of the human body – black bile, yellow bile, blood and phlegm – back into the right balance for the individual concerned. Hall favoured preparations that induced vomiting or the evacuation of the bowels. He did not recommend bloodletting, which was starting to decline in favour by the beginning of the 17th century. Oil paintings on the wall depict methods of diagnosis, including a common approach known as casting the water. A physician would examine and even taste a patient's urine for signs of illness often reaching a conclusion without actually seeing the patient in person. In this painting, a seated doctor wearing black clothes and hat with a red cloak examines the flask of urine he holds up. Steps down lead to the hallway and the base of the main stairs. To the left is a door out to the garden and another into the kitchen. The kitchen displays 17th century cooking tools on a large hearth and central table. It is part of an extension added in 1631. The grand staircase up to the first floor has a banister on the right side and leads to a spacious landing with the master bedroom and exhibition spaces leading off it. The four rooms on this floor would all once have been bedrooms. The visitor route is a loop through the interconnecting rooms, following a roped path. Firstly through the master bedroom, then into an exhibition space, past a second bedroom, and finally through another small exhibition space to return to the landing. 
several of the rooms have a step or ramp at the threshold. On the landing hangs an oil painting by an unknown artist, Death and the Maiden, from around 1570. It's a vanitas, a symbolic work of art designed to remind beholders of the fleeting nature of earthly pleasures. A description is available to listen to in the online object recordings. The barrel-vaulted master bedroom is dressed to give an impression of domestic life with a four-poster bed, chests and an ornate wooden commode or toilet. There are examples of 17th century costumes on mannequins and a few items that can be tried on. After walking through a larger exhibition room featuring changing displays of items from the collection, you will come to the second bedroom on your right. The second bedroom can't be entered, but the open doorway shows a cosy, low-ceilinged space with a bed in the centre, bedside tables and chests tucked by the walls. There are two mannequins, one dressed in a child's white nightdress with a tie at the neck, full sleeves and skirt, the other displaying an adult's mustard yellow frock, tight at the waist with long sleeves and skirt. Though she married twice, Elizabeth, Susanna and John's daughter had no children and was William Shakespeare's last descendant. A short walk through a second small exhibition space leads back to the landing. Back downstairs you can visit the large tranquil walled garden. It contains a paved area to the rear of the house with picnic benches. There are toilets to the right, including an accessible toilet. Beyond the paved area, steps lead up to a pathway between verdant beds of pink roses, yellow goldenrods and sea holly, depending on the season. A sundial stands at the top of the path. Adjacent to the house is a large lawn, reached by steps up or a ramp with handrails. Near to the lawn's edge is a grand old mulberry tree. It's almost as tall as the gabled roof of the house, with one particularly thick, low branch extending for several metres, supported by brick towers. James I imported mulberry trees to be planted to feed silkworms in order to cultivate a silk industry in Britain. Though James's plan failed, many trees were planted, and three of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust sites now have or have had mulberry trees, which are said to be derived from a mulberry planted by Shakespeare at the site of New Place. In the shade of the mulberry leaves is a bronze sculpture by Greg Wyatt, inspired by a Midsummer Night's Dream, which can be touched. Standing at almost head height, it's an organic, wave-like shape with an ass's head in profile turned to the left, emerging from the front. An extract from the play with raised letters is on the back of the sculpture. Beyond the mulberry, there's a medicinal garden. Circular with gravel paths cutting across it, the garden contains thyme, rosemary and lavender, as well as vegetables and flowers. The exit is back inside the building, via the main entrance on the ground floor. The Shakespeare Birthplace Trust website, shakespeare.org.uk, has a wealth of further resources, including information about access. You can also phone on 01789 204 016.